Thank you, Andrew. Welcome to worship, everyone, this morning. This morning, we're going to be looking at the transfiguration. And to set us in the right mood for worship, we're going to be listening to our Old Testament reading, which is a psalm, followed by an eyewitness account from Peter, who saw God's glory. And so I hand over to Linda to read Psalm 50. Thank you, Linda. Psalm 50 verses one to six. The mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it sets. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heavens above and the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me this consecrated people who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heavens proclaim his righteousness, for he is a God of justice. Amen. Uh, the second letter of Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 to 19. But we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honour and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Amen. Thank you. And we join in worshipping our God as we sing our first hymn, which is number 65 in Singing the Faith, if you have a book, but the words will be on the screen. Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom, come to him and bless his name. Mercy he has shown us, his love is forever, faithful to the end of days. Come then, all you nations, sing of the Lord's goodness, melodies of praise. Bless his name. 
Let's come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, on mountaintops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our heart's desire is to bask in the amazing glory of the divine presence. With each encounter, we are changed and transformed. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of divine glory. May we walk among our friends and our families and our communities as a blessing, bearing light in dark places, hope to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. Our world is hurting, and we need the followers of Jesus to follow more closely. Maybe then we will hear your voice speaking to us and saying, listen, listen to my son, the beloved. Forgive us, God, when we linger too long by the waters and on the mountaintops, enthralled with the glory that flows from you. And yet we fail to listen to your voice leading and guiding us. Shake us from our contentment and send us forward, empowered by you. The God of Elijah, the God of Moses and the God of Jesus desires mercy more than sacrifice and a contrite heart rather than burnt offerings. Love God and do the right thing and forgiveness shall be your friend and mercy your true companion. Amen. And we join our thoughts and our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Please feel free to unmute yourself and don't worry if there is a cacophony of noise. And so we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven. hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, thy kingdom, come, kingdom come, thy will, thy will, will be, be done, done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give us our today our daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we have those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation. But deliver, but deliver us, us from evil. For thy mind is the kingdom, power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to listen to our gospel reading, which is going to be read to us by Joan. Thank you, Joan. Luke 9, verses 28 to 36, The Transfiguration. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James and John with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendour, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfilment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son. Whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and told no one at that time 
what they have seen. Amen. Thank you, Joan. And as we think upon that reading, we are going to be singing or listening to our next hymn, which is number 20 in Singing the Faith. Be still. presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Come bow before Him now with reverence and fear. In Him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Be still for the glory of the Lord is shining all around. Burns with holy fire, with splendor he is crowned. How awesome is the signs, our radiant King of light. Be still, for the glory of the Lord is shining. is moving in this place is moving in this place be still We're now going to listen to a short poem. Thank you. I'm reading a poem called Transfiguration by Malcolm Geit. For that one moment, in and out of time, on that one mountain where all moments meet, the daily veil that covers the sublime in darkling glass fell dazzled at his feet. There were no angels full of eyes and wings, just living glory full of truth and grace. The love that dances at the heart of things shone out upon us from a human face. And to that light, the light in us leapt up. We felt it quicken somewhere deep within. A sudden blaze of long extinguished hope trembled and tingled through the tender skin. Nor can this blackened sky, this darkened scar, eclipse that glimpse of how things really are. The daily veil that covers the sublime. I love that verse. And it reminds me of when my children were younger. And I have got with me, um, you may have seen this before, my colouring book. And it's a bit like when you have the outline of 
things, you know things, but you don't really know things as they really are. You have the outline and then you have the colour. And that's a bit like when my children were little, when they first discovered a microscope. And when they first discovered a microscope, they would pick up anything and everything they could get their hands on and put it under the microscope so that they could see things that they thought they already knew. And yet, when they put it under that microscope, the more intricate detail that was there on simple things like a petal of a daisy and how amazing and overawed they were by what they were seeing. And Peter, James and John and the other disciples thought that they knew Jesus. They had a rough idea of what they thought was going to happen what they thought Jesus's mission was. And yet, Jesus said to them one day, who do people say I am? And their response was, well, some say you're John the Baptist, others Elijah, or perhaps another prophet. And uh, Jesus says to Peter, well, who do you say I am? And Peter says, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus sort of says to them, well, yes, I am. But they, the disciples were waiting for a certain type of savior, a certain type of Messiah. Somebody that they were waiting for was somebody who was going to liberate the people from the greatest enemies the Roman Empire. And yet Jesus was telling them, well, I am the Messiah, but I've come to die. I've come to suffer and to die at the hands of the Romans. And so the disciples were perhaps absolutely devastated. Everything they thought they knew had now been knocked sideways. And it's at this point when they are on this roller coaster of emotions where perhaps they're even thinking, are we following the right person after all? You know, they've been with him for years and walked closely with him, learning from him. And now everything they thought they knew have been blown to pieces. And it was at this point that Jesus says to them, come away with me to Peter, James and John up the mountain to pray. And so they went up, traditionally it was Mount Tabor, and they went to the mountain and they prayed together and they spent time together. And then just as they had done, uh, just as they were going to do in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, James and John began to feel their eyelids drooping and they fell asleep. And it's while they were sleeping that Jesus began to be transfigured, transformed, uh, absolutely shining with the glory of God. And then they woke up and they saw what was happening. And there was Jesus. And alongside Jesus was Elijah and Moses representing the law and the prophets. And they could see that Jesus was in this glorified state. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a very, very bad habit. I expect you all have very bad habits. But my very bad habit is I love to read books. But, but, and this is a big but, if I'm finding the plot of the book not to my liking, or I am beginning to get anxious about what might happen, I get very uptight and on edge. And my go-to thing is to go to the back of the book and read the final chapter so that I know how things will pan out so that I haven't got to worry. And I can see a few shakes of heads at me, but it's what I do. We all have our bad habits. And I think this, in a way, is the veil being lifted. It's almost like they were panicking, saying, well, this isn't how we imagined it. This is going to end in a disaster. We want liberation. 
and then you're going to die on a cross. This, you know, you're going to die at the hands of the Romans. This isn't what we wanted. And this is almost like that book being shown the last chapter so that you can see that actually it is going to work out okay. Yes, Jesus will die, but this is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is what was meant to happen. And then we have that little phrase in there where Peter decides that he was going to make, uh, I think in the version that was read, a shelter for Jesus and Elijah and Moses. And quite often we were taught that Peter actually is one of those people that gets confused. And when he gets confused, he likes to talk too much and he makes rash decisions. But actually, was he being, rather than filling an awkward silence, not knowing what to do, was he actually doing the right thing? Because he was, after all, a Jew. And the Jews would celebrate, and it suggested that this was about this time of year, the Feast of the Tabernacles. And in the Feast of the Tabernacles, it was a week of celebration, a time to draw near to God, a time to experience God's glory. And in Leviticus 20. Three, it gives us instructions, gives the people instructions for celebrating the Feast of the Tabernacle. And it says the people are told to go out and to gather leafy branches, bring them home and build temporary tabernacles or shelters. And during the week, the family will meet there and feast and rejoice before God. And so it was a time to feast before God, to gather in these temporary shelters and to celebrate God's glory both in the past and the present and looking to the future. And so perhaps it was the natural thing to build a shelter, a tabernacle for God's glory to reside in. You see, Peter recognized what was happening. God was revealing God's glory. And so it did seem the right thing to do. But what does all this mean for us today? Well, the light of the transfiguration points to Jesus, our Emmanuel, our God with us. And in John 1, 4, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt, or translated literally as tabernacled amongst us, and we behold his glory. The one who has come in, into the darkness of our sin, our pain, and our brokenness has begun the process of making all things new, through his death and his resurrection. And as you remember, there was one commandment given within the gospel reading that was read. And that was where God said, listen, this is my son, listen to him. And do we always listen to God? When we're in the dark times, when we feel we are no longer on that mountaintop, but rather we feel as if we've been plunged into the deepest, darkest valley, do we always listen to God? Do we always try and go back to that mountain place, to that place with God where we can be with him and listen to him and gain comfort um, from his presence? Today, we are reflecting upon the transfiguration in preparation for Lent. The Transfiguration is actually celebrated on the 6th of August traditionally and with this in mind I share with you some thoughts by the Reverend N.T. Wright. Tom Wright draws the links between the Transfiguration and the Crucifixion and he says this, here on the mountain Jesus is revealed in glory. There on a hill outside Jerusalem, he, Jesus is revealed in shame. Here his clothes are shining white. There they are stripped off and soldiers have gambled for them. Here he is flanked by Moses and Elijah, two of Israel's greatest heroes, representing the law and the prophets. And there he is flanked by two brigands, representing the level to which Israel had sunk in rebellion against God. Here, a bright cloud overshadows the scene. 
and there darkness comes upon the land. Here, Peter blurts out how wonderful it all is. There, he is hiding in shame after denying he even knows Jesus. Here, a voice from God himself declares that this is his wonderful son. And there, a pagan soldier declares in surprise that this really was God's son. The mountaintop explains the hilltop and vice versa. Learn to see the glory in the cross and learn to see the cross in the glory. And you will have begun to see, uh, begun to bring together the laughter and the tears of the God who hides in the cloud, the God who is to be known in the strange person of Jesus himself. Amen. And we listen to our next hymn, which is called Bless the Lord. Oh, my God. 
I don't know if any of you spotted any familiar faces in that Methodist choir. I saw at least three of my friends there, which was lovely to see. I don't know if Julie has found a photo. She was going to share with us a photo of the church at uh, Mount Tabor, wasn't it, Julie? I went there in 1987 and um, I was quite surprised actually how lush the landscape was. Um, and as you went up Mount Tabor, you literally went round and round and round almost in circles as you went up. It was windy road all the way up to the very top. And then there was this chapel there. That's the actual chapel. And I believe it's meant to represent uh, the, the Elijah and Moses with Jesus in the middle. I think that's what it's meant to represent, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. And I invite um, Neil to share our intercessory prayers with us. Thank you, Neil. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through Jesus. For allowing us to see your glory on the mountaintop for revealing the depth of your love for us and for the world you created. In the transforming power of that love, we bring into your presence those people and situations that we long to see transformed. We pray for countries around the world that are being torn apart by war, for refugees looking for safety, for those imprisoned for their faith, and for those who will go hungry today, and those who struggle to bring democracy into their land. We pray for this country and those in power, particularly those who are working to bring this pandemic to an end. For those who are in control of the economy, seeking ways for people to survive financially when they are unemployed or unable to work for food banks and other charities who reach out to help the hungry and the homeless. We pray for those who are sick, for those affected by the pandemic, those who are ill, for those who suffer from long COVID and for all who have been bereaved. We pray for those whose treatment has been delayed because of the virus and who are in pain and whose condition is deteriorating. And we give thanks for all health workers who have given so much over the last year and for those who have developed and those who are delivering the vaccine. In a moment of silence in our hearts, we bring before God those we know who need our prayers. And finally, we pray, we pray for ourselves. God of the mountain top and the valley, <clears throat> when the mountain is steep and we are tired, bless us with your strength. When the mountain is misty and we are afraid, bless us with your peace. When the mountain is covered with the snow of uncertainty, bless us with your courage. And when the mountain is beautiful, bless us with gratitude and a sense of wonder that you are with us always. In Jesus' name, we offer these our prayers. Amen. And we sing our closing hymn, number 59 in Seeing the Faith, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Play, Spirit, play. Display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Um, Sam, I believe, has also got some photos that she'd like to share with us before the blessing. Well, it's um, it's the pictures that the kids have done. So we oh, talked about yeah, we talked about transformation. So we decided to transform the church so you they could pick to transform an area of the church or the whole church. Um, so Liam has transformed our church into a volcano church. So we would all we would all be inside the volcano. And he said it wasn't an active volcano. Which, which, which You've made a lorry as well. So I'm not sure if Flo wants to show her picture that she was working on. Well, I am the wait no. I only transformed a bit of the church, but it's like at the back because, um, well, I used to play like, um, well, when from the doors, if you went down and like 
to the back, there was a little grassy area with a tree. And I transformed that area into like a little um, like fruit and vegetable patch and like a greenhouse, like a community garden area. Oh, super. That's such a good idea. Oh, it's lovely. Well, I've done. Heard. I like that idea. I You're on yeah. the church council, you see. I that's that. strawberries. Yes. Yeah. That uh-huh. tree's already I there, and that's, that's like that. the greenery area. So that's uh-huh. just got like potted plants in, and then that's a raspberry bush. Oh no! So I really so, like that idea, Flo. I really do. Flo's idea was that after the service, instead of serving biscuits or as well as, mm-hmm. um, that everybody could eat the fruit. Ideal idea. We need you on the church council, Flo. We really. I do. think we might need fruit after lockdown as well. All the biscuits of lockdown. I, I've I've put on two stone. I tell you. How oh, well, keep one. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Thank you for sharing. That's super. Let's have the blessing, and then we can have our coffee time with biscuits. Go now, assured of God's love for you. Keep watch for God's presence and wait for God's glory to surprise you in unexpected ways. And the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.